Don't believe the lies. Hello, everybody. I am Nick the Naval Architect. Electric power and electric propulsion are still growing industries for yachts and small ships. It's the wild frontier of the maritime industry. And on that frontier, you're going to find many geniuses and a few thieves who just want to bend the truth so that they can make a sale. We are going to cover some common myths about electric yachts. Let's get into this. Now, before we get started, I just want to give some thanks to Jeff Cote from Pacific Yacht Systems. He provided a lot of advice that helped me to organize these videos. So please go check out his YouTube channel and his website. You can find many more videos there about electric systems on yachts. Myth number one, electric power is always better. Nope. The technology has its limits, like any other industrial technology. When applying electric power to a small boat, you need to start by considering three major facts. Number one, weight matters. It's important to consider the weight. Number two, the electric batteries are always going to fall far short of combustion engines. And number three, electric propulsion comes with its own environmental impact. You don't get it completely for free. Ships are floating objects. And with floating objects like ships, we always need to consider the impact of weight. Extra weight means that the ship sits lower in the water, which increases the power requirements. You have to spend more power to travel through the water. And that really matters with electric propulsion because those batteries and that motor, they often weigh more than the combustion engine that they're trying to replace. So very often, our ship is going to require more power for the same speeds, just from the burden of that extra weight. So let's play this out. The table on your screen shows an apples for apples comparison between electric propulsion and the equivalent combustion engine on a small 30 foot sailing yacht. This is reproducing the exact same runtime and the exact same power. The electric option was nearly 32 times heavier. That more than doubled the total weight of the ship, which really means that doing an exact replacement for electric propulsion is really not tenable. There's just too much of a weight burden. Most of that extra weight came in the form of electric batteries. They're just too heavy. This brings us to the second point. Batteries are always going to require far more weight to store the equivalent energy of diesel fuel. So for any practical installation, this is going to require some type of a compromise because batteries alone just don't cut it. Electric propulsion is going to require a more complicated plan for energy storage and utilization. Complexity, that's the key difference here. With electric propulsion, we're accepting more complexity. More complexity means more equipment, more manufacturing, more CO2 produced. And this is important because the big motivation for electric propulsion is to shift to a more environmentally friendly option, to a sustainable method of yachting. But batteries aren't free. They come with their own environmental impact. Just looking at the CO2 production, our batteries release about 28 tons of CO2 just to manufacture them. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's not too bad when you consider that the batteries are reusable. The diesel fuel, on the other hand, you burn it once and it's done. So the CO2 released from producing the batteries, that was only about 10% of the CO2 that will be released from the equivalent of energy in diesel fuel over the entire lifetime. Now, clearly, electric propulsion offers some major benefits. I like the idea of producing less CO2. The real story behind electric propulsion always involves more complexity and nuance. It's not a simple solution that solves every problem. You can't expect simple here. Electric propulsion means more complexity, new costs, and the value of that complexity depends on your individual goals. 
It's not just a straight question anymore of how do I make the go boat go forward. We now need to ask if this technology works for your specific situation. So what makes electric propulsion important for you? What are you trying to get out of it? And that might mean that you're paying a penalty of reduced range, but you're very much getting the more important thing out of reduced environmental impact. That's a personal decision that you have to think about individually. Myth number two, e-power versus horsepower. Oh, I hate this one. In the early days of electric propulsion, some sales agents tried to hide the inferior motor performance. They were advertising their power as e-power or kilowatts or kW power. They fostered this myth that electric power somehow operates different from conventional engines. It's a magic power. You can't judge them the same. They're not comparable. This is wrong. They are absolutely comparable. Power is power. It doesn't matter if that power comes from an electric motor or a combustion engine or a horse pulling a plow. The only difference in all of this is the unit of measurement. Electric motors, they usually measure their power in units of kilowatts. And here in the USA, engines typically measure their power in units of horsepower. You can easily convert between these two units of measurement. The conversion factor is right there on your screen. So yes, you have every right to compare power in electric motors versus combustion engines. I do it all the time. And here's another warning as well. If you look at the table on your screen, you'll see that sometimes when people are comparing kilowatts and equivalent engine of horsepower in specifications, that they won't always actually work out to the same unit. If you were to convert the kilowatts into horsepower, you'll see that it's a different number. Thankfully, the vendor that I'm showing on the screen didn't do that. They were honest. Uh, the kilowatt power that they're showing matches the equivalent number in horsepower. Myth number three, peak power. Yes, marketing has another trick to overstate the performance of electric motors, the peak power. When you're reviewing the performance of an electric motor, you'll see that they often advertise two power settings, a continuous power and then a peak power, which is sometimes around 25% higher. Don't depend on that peak power. That's a good way to burn out the motor. You see, it all comes down to heat. Heat plays a major factor in limiting the power of both electric motors and combustion engines. Both of these devices produce large amounts of heat, which slowly raises the temperature in the engine or motor. Left unchecked, this raises the temperature so high that the engine or motor is going to melt or fuse together or generally just be a very bad day that has turned your expensive machine into an expensive paperweight. To stop that from happening, we build in a cooling system to remove that heat from the engine or motor. But the cooling system can only pull out heat so fast. It has an upper limit. The continuous power setting of the engine or motor, that's matching that upper limit for heat extraction. It holds that at a steady temperature and can continue to do that until the end of time. With peak power, we go past that limit. You're now running on borrowed time. The cooling system, it can't keep up. The heat builds up and the temperature slowly rises in the motor. Now this can take several minutes, but temperatures eventually climb to the danger point. Thankfully, these motors usually have a built-in safety switch. It will trigger before you do any major damage and completely shut down the motor. But once it's off, it stays off. The motor needs to cool down before you can turn it on again. That takes several minutes. So why on earth would you even have a setting for peak power? Well, because sometimes you really want that burst of extra power. Imagine that you're in a storm getting blown towards some rocks. It would be really nice to have that extra power to push away from the rocks in a hurry. That's what peak power is for. 
It's a wonderful bonus feature in electric propulsion, but don't rely on it for constant operation. When you're selecting your motors, when you're picking that size, you always want to go with the continuous power setting. Number four, direct drive. Some vendors claim that they're offering a direct drive option for maximum efficiency. That motor is hooked directly to the propeller shaft. There's nothing in the middle, no gearbox to sap away efficiency. Wait, why? Whoever said that direct drive was the more efficient? I mean, yes, a gearbox or a belt drive, those do lose around two to 4% of the power due to friction losses. But forcing a bad match between the propeller and the motor, well, that could lose you 10 to 15% of the power. And it does this because you're forcing the propeller into a bad speed. The propeller and the motor both prefer different rotation speeds for their maximum efficiency. In general, propellers want slower speeds, somewhere around 150 to 500 RPM. But somewhere in that range is this perfect rotation speed where the propeller works at its maximum efficiency. It's doing really well at converting that rotational power into a forward thrust. Except the electric motor doesn't like that speed. Electric motors, they compensate for their lower torque by usually operating at a higher rotation speed. For example, one electric drive that I saw rotates at 1,140 RPM. Now that's well above the preferred range for a propeller. On a direct drive system, those two speeds are going to match. So which one do you pick? Do you want an efficient electric motor that's attached to a bad propeller? Or do you want a bad electric motor attached to an efficient propeller? Thankfully, with indirect drives, you don't need to pick. The gearbox shifts that high RPM from the electric motor down to the lower RPM of the propeller. This gearing also steps up the torque that's going into the propeller. That's a major help when you're employing an electric motor that's running on limited DC voltage. This also adds in a great flexibility when matching the propeller and the motor together. After all, gearboxes can be ordered from a range of different gear ratios. So that's going to make it much easier to find the right combination between the motor and the propeller. Yes, the gearbox is sacrificing a little efficiency in that transmission, but in the process, we're gaining back much more efficiency by ensuring that both the motor and the propeller operate in ideal conditions. Myth number five, slow is safe? Run longer by just going slower. This is the common marketing explanation when you're discussing battery life. Travel slow enough and solar panels could recharge as you go. Just motor each day and recharge that power with renewable energy. <sighs> but the math doesn't add up. This strategy may be possible with sail propulsion, but not with solar alone. Solar power for propulsion, it depends on running at extremely slow speeds. To balance the energy input from solar power, most ships, they're normally limited to around two to four knots of speed for only eight hours a day. Now that sounds great for a lazy vacation, but this ignores the safety aspect. Propulsion is not just a means of going from point A to point B. We also need that electric motor for control over the ship in a storm. The propulsion needs to supply a minimum power level, and they need to do that for more than a day to maintain control throughout those storm conditions. This is the emergency that we need to plan for. And that's why reliable electric propulsion still includes an electric generator. It provides that backup source of energy, and it provides a reliable power supply during the long durations of a storm when you might be running at full speed. Reliability is key. We can't give that up when we're trying to switch to electric propulsion. Electric propulsion, it's not a drop-in replacement for your combustion engine. And this may be the biggest myth of all. 
we tend to compare electric propulsion as just a straight replacement for the current way of doing business. But now the game is changing. Do we also measure that success based on the cost to the environment? Do we still need to maintain that same level of reliability and safety? Yeah, I think we do. So before weighing your options, start first by eliminating the myths. And the first one you can really eliminate is the myth of why are you doing this? Start by asking what makes electric propulsion worth it to you? Clarify that goal first, and the rest is going to get a lot easier. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. How on earth do they do it? Have you ever wondered how the large commercial ships do all these amazing things? DMS brings that same engineering to smaller operators. Take the chance to create a high-performance ship. Stand out from your competitors. So check out the website, and together, let's build something awesome!